Hey, what's up, guys? And welcome to episode 25 of Mr. Millennial's Revenge. I'm your host, Nick DiMaria. Thanks for tuning in. On the podcast this week, I am incredibly excited to share with you my conversation with Dr. Eddie Henderson. Yes, finally got him on the show. Not that it was that difficult. <laughs> he was he was very, very happy to be on it, and I appreciate uh, his excitement and enthusiasm. But uh, yeah, you know, I, I think I've mentioned him every episode, so it was just a matter of time before I got him on the show. And uh we dive into some of the some of the stories that he doesn't normally tell. So, if you're familiar with uh, you know writings and interviews with Eddie, uh, usually hear um, some you know of course important moments in his life, but um, there's so much more that uh, doesn't get told as often. So we kind of dig into that, and uh, I'm really excited to share that with you guys. Uh, But first, I'm really excited to announce that the new Haven Jazz Underground will be partnering with the brand new Black Rock Social House in Bridgeport on Fairfield Avenue. It's the old Walrus and uh, Carpenter spot. Uh, A lot of musicians all know that uh, particular building. Uh, My good buddy Mark is opening up a new, well, has opened up a new restaurant. And the food is amazing. Uh, The cocktails are amazing. The vibe's amazing. And Mark has always been a huge supporter of jazz in um, in everything that Underground has done. So uh, we're going to kick off a brand new jazz brunch um, featuring yours truly. Uh, and I'll be accompanied by uh, guitarist Brian Sudo this Sunday, March 21st, 2021 at 1130 a.m. And uh, we're going to, you know, we're kicking off the weekly brunch. Um, I think for this series, there's going to be a little bit, uh, some more rotation going on. You know, we're going to try to get in. Uh, some more artists and um, we also uh, will be starting up a Wednesday night jazz series Uh, we're just finalizing the details for that now so stay tuned because uh, music's coming back baby (laughs) life's coming back fuck COVID man we're gonna get through it and we're gonna celebrate so if you are available please come down Sunday uh, March 21st 2021 1130 to 2.30 p.m. Uh, and have uh, some delicious brunch and listen to some tunes. So, uh, yeah, really excited about that. Um, Mind the Hang went so great that uh, we actually have a backlog of uh, bands uh, ready to go, and unfortunately we just don't have enough dates. It's really cool, <laughs> you know, from the from the show organizer's perspective, I'll say. So uh, Mind the Hang with the um, Schmidt Brothers went incredible. Check it out on YouTube and Facebook, facebook.com slash nhvju. And uh, the YouTube channel is NHV Jazz, I believe. Um, but yeah, we're going to continue doing that series uh, throughout the year. And as long as uh, things kind of remain the way they are, we're going to. So that reminds me, real quick, I want to get to the interview. So let's do this quick. Mr. Millennial's Revenge is a production of the New Haven Jazz Underground, which is a grassroots community-based organization dedicated to producing concerts, clinics, and jam sessions in the name of jazz in the great city of New Haven, Connecticut, the pizza capital of the world. And we need your help. Go to patreon.com slash nhvju and sign up for as low as $2 a month and you can help directly fund our efforts producing the mind the hang series and other concerts and jam session opportunities for musicians and man also three sheets coming back they uh they announced yesterday on social media that they will be uh opening back up sometime between april 1st and april 15th and i am calling all jazz fans and jazz listeners and jazz musicians especially the members of the jam session who regularly frequented it we need to do our part Get down there, order some drinks, order some food, hang out. If you're not feeling comfortable staying there and there's not enough seating that makes you feel comfortable, order takeout. The food is amazing, and Three Sheets has always been our home base. So do your part because they've always been good to us. They're opening back up, like I said, sometime in April. Be on the lookout for it and help support 
the uh, uh, you know a great joint so that we can get back and get that jam session back and start you know melting faces again so again go to patreon.com slash nhvju sign up for as low as two dollars a month two five ten twenty dollars whatever you can afford it all goes to working musicians and creating opportunities for musicians to play in the great city of new haven connecticut so please consider becoming a, a subscriber thank you for that and speaking of sub subscribers hit uh subscribe on youtube and on Apple Podcasts, where you can find Mr. Millennial's Revenge, please leave me a review. It would greatly help. It gets more attention to the pod and, um, and more attention to what we're doing. So please, please do that. And uh, yeah, I think that'll do it. I want to get to the interview. I am so excited. So I've talked about uh, Eddie Henderson a lot on this show. He has been my mentor since 2003. I talk about how I met him. I talk about how I uh, discovered him. And he has been nothing but a gracious, uh, sweet human being. And I couldn't ask for a better teacher in my life. And I am so grateful that I could share, uh, you know, some stories that he uh, and I talked about uh, live on the show, you know, or recorded on the show or whatever you want to call it. Um, I think nobody plays like Eddie. <laughs> I know that's a fucking far out s a statement, but I mean it. Um, he is such a unique voice. He is such a presence. You know when you're listening to Eddie Henderson. And um, I feel like he's, you know, I want to tell his story. I want to share the information that he t uh, taught me. And, you know, I've said before, and um, he was a student of Lee Morgan's, Miles Davis, Freddie Hubbard. He was friends with these guys. He stood shoulder to shoulder with them. And, man, he talks about some great stories uh, about hanging out with these guys. So, without further ado, let's get to my interview with the wonderful, the one and the only, the great Dr. Joining me now via Zoom, ladies and gentlemen, this is such a treat for me, Dr. Eddie Henderson. Welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. This means Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Yeah, really looking forward to this. We've known each other for so many years. It's wonderful <laughs> to do this with you. Uh, yeah, we have. And uh, you'll just have to bear with me, uh, smiling ear to ear for this whole show, because I feel me this too. one, this <laughs> one's personal. You know, this this one's really yeah. personal. Um, so, you know, this is a jazz podcast. We're going to talk about jazz and music and everything. And I was saying to you before, I wanted to showcase kind of like the, the, the stories you may not have told. You, you know, okay. we, we all know the stories of, you know, Louis Armstrong giving you the first lesson and, and right. you know, you hanging out with Miles Davis and all that stuff. So, right, right. so I, wa I wanted to tell the world all the other stuff, you know, everything else okay. that you've done. So especially basically like fo focusing you on you as a leader, you know, okay. as, as, a, as, as your own, as your own artist. So, so my first question to you, and, and I just realized this today is the M1 Dishi album came out 50 years ago this month. Remember, today. Uh, I don't know about today specifically, but I saw that Herbie Hancock had posted on social media that M1 Dishi is 50 years old. It came out in March of 1971. Well, so, I'll be. So the uh, timing, <laughs> the yeah, timing yeah. is uncanny. Yeah, because I was thinking about that yesterday. It almost seems when I think about that era, and then I realized that was a quarter, I mean, a half a century ago. But it's so vivid in my mind because that, that was when, the, the big light went on in my head about yeah. what I wanted to do in life. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, man, there's some, co you know, there's some cosmic work at play because I met you. So I met you in April of, tw of 2003 and wow. And just by chance, those weeks leading up to, um, when you came to Western Connecticut state university, I had gone to a, a, a record shop, and I and I was a huge Herbie fan. I wanted to complete my collection. You know, I had Maiden Voyage and I had taken off I in Imperial Isles. I wanted to complete my, right. my collection of Herbie. So I go to this record store 
and I pick up Speak Like a Child. Mm -hmm. I pick up The Prisoner and I'm going, you know, I'm going in chronological order. I already own Headhunters. So the next the next album I, I see in the, you know, in the rack is Sexton. And I, you know, and I'm looking, I'm looking at the back and I go, huh, you know, this is like the same, you know, almost the same year as Headhunters, but this is a different band. And exactly. I was like, there's a trumpet player on this band. So I was like super excited. Hey. So I go back to my dorm with my buddy. We fire up Sextant and boom, my brains were on the wall. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, I just, I, I, I remember one, I remember saying, play it again because I had no idea what I had listened to. I had yeah. never heard anything like that. Yeah, yeah. I don't think anybody in that band had heard anything, or even the audience had, because uh, that band was really ahead of its time. Yeah. You know, uh, Did- for the people in the band and, and, and the audience also. How how similar does the tr- do the track sound to... Um- what it felt like in the studio. Do you, do you remember listening to the album and being like, wow, that's what it sounds like? Or did it sound what you thought it would sound like? Where, that's you, what it was. You know, that band was working like uh, for three years, I would say between nine and 10 months a year. Yeah. And then wow. so, uh, yeah, imagine that yeah. all around the world, you know, across the country, the Southern route, the, the, the Northern route, uh, to Europe. We never went to Japan with that band, but all over Europe, all the festivals. Yeah. And it, it was the, it, it was the band and, and that was ahead of its time during that era, the early seventies. And Sexton, I will say, sounded like the band because that that's with Patrick Gleason on there also. Yeah. That's the one with rain dance and Hornets. And yeah, Shadows. that's how the, so that that band, now that particular album was the third one of M1 DC. Right. The first one was called M1 DC. The second was called Crossings. Crossings, yeah. Now, now, in chronological order, the first one, M1 DC, was sort of representative of how, how the new band started playing the new vocabulary. Because yeah. as you said, you know, speak like a child and prisoner. It was more author, Fat Albert Rotunda. Yeah. yeah. It was more in the traditional sense. But but the way M1 Dishi got started, uh, one of the tunes on there, you know when you get there, I was here, we originally did that as, a, as a, a, a commercial for Eastern Airlines, just a 30-second commercial. Yeah. <laughs> You know, mm-hmm. and, and so Herbie said, well, let's do this on the album uh, that that was on the M1 Dish album. And then just like wide open spaces, see what happens. Yeah. And then Astonata was on there. That thing in 158. Which is the Astonato rhythm. I know on, on my music paper, my first record date I ever had in my life. That was the first tune we did. And on a, a blank piece of ledger paper, you know, I was scared to death. <laughs> and so in between, in the middle of the ledge of the paper, in between the ledger line, Herbie writes three eighth notes, not even in the staff. So I said, well, where am I supposed to put this? So he says to me, well, if you don't know, maybe I should get somebody else. So I said, I said give me one shot. Me <laughs> wow. One shot. <laughs> Be a- yeah, yeah. But wow. that, 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 that's the only guidelines he gave me. Yeah. You know, so it, it was such, and Herbie never told anybody how to play or what to do. He had racehorses, so just let him run. Yeah. <laughs> Don't hold the racehorses back, you know. So he was, he was like in, in his experimental, you know, mode. That's yeah. how everybody was in that particular band. Yeah. And that's yeah. how the whole, concept changed. I think that concept was a derivative because a, a bitch's brew, Miles Davis, came out just a little before that. Right. And we had all listened to that concept. So I think that that Dan Wandishi was a, the next step in line from Bitch's Brew. So Ostinato was on the first M1 DC album. 
you know, when you get there. And on the other side, the whole track was a wandering spirit song by Julian Priester. Sounds like a big orchestral thing. Yeah. We got yeah. A, before we did the record, we got a chance to hone that. Uh, we had a gig at uh, the London House. And, and, and for one month, five or six nights a week, every night. And it was really like a steakhouse, a real high-class, sophisticated steakhouse. Yeah. So when we came in there playing, you know, the, the like... <laughs> 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 right, right. And that stuff. They weren't the ready for it. Says, the people can't eat. So, so they stopped us playing the first set. We just let people digest their food. Then we come in there. And that's where I, I think the really the M1 DC concept changed, you know. Yeah. And moving along chronologically to the second album, Sextant, uh, was same kind of concept, just open skies, you know. Uh, crossings, you mean? Huh? Crossings, the second one? Crossings. Yeah, yeah. That's what I mean. Crossings. Yeah, yeah, right, right. And, and, and on that, we had like quasar uh, uh crossings i even forgot the other names of the um, tunes oh my a sleeping giant is the other so one your sleeping what, giant water torture Sometimes we played that in person that was at, at the gig that might last two two and a half hours yeah it's that one tune i believe it i believe you know. it. There is a there's a bootleg recording on the internet of of the Wandishi band playing uh, Sleeping Giant and it's like two hours long. It's, it's oh, oh you know, it was for, an event. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no doubt. And so 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 much so much to add. So first off, um, I don't think I, I don't know if I ever told you, but for my senior recital when I was a when I was graduating college, you know, putting on putting on my final recital of my college career, and I had added. Uh, ostinato to the set list. And you, you know, did that, man. Yeah. I remember it. And I, well, I don't know if I told you this part, but uh, I had I had three professors. You know, they were adjudicating me. You know, as uh -huh. they, as they do. And one of them said, <laughs> one of them said, if you play that tune, I'm gonna fail you. He was just not. Get a fan. I swear to God, if you play that tune, I will give you an F. I actually got a C in my you know in my senior recital grade. Yeah. Because I got an A, an A, and an F, because I play. I refuse to not play. I, I that 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 tune had meant too much to me, you know. At that, so point. he actually gave you an F. Yeah, yeah. You know, well, <laughs> uh, on that same page, don't feel bad because you know Benny Golson, the great Benny Golson, sure, who yep. wrote like Whisper Not, yep. Along Came Betty, yeah, uh, uh, Killer Joe, sure. So he, well, he went before I went to medical school at Howard. University. Benny was in the music department. He he left there. He never graduated because his first composition uh, in, in his composition class, first tune he wrote was Killer Joe, right? Uh -huh. So the teacher gave him an F and flunked him out because he said at that time that was against the law to play two dominant seventh chords back to back in that order, you know, a whole step. Forward. It was against the law. Yeah. Whose law? Wow. You know, yeah. and that's yeah. Benny Goldson's biggest hit. So I'm telling you, don't feel bad. Oh, no, you know, no, I don't. <laughs> but but that <laughs> makes me feel even more. Uh, it makes me feel better even more. Oh, yeah. But and, um, and, and, and yeah. those professors, you know, they're academians. They're not really players. You know, they're, sure. they're, they're, I make a general statement. A lot of professors who don't actively play in the real world, they're just so uh, paranoid or cautious about what they will accept into their school. So don't feel bad at all. Oh, I, you know, I don't. And thank you yeah. for that. Thank you. Yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, you know, and it's funny. Um, I remember. So I get I get Sexton and then they announce uh, that you're going to be a guest clinician at, at my college. And I'll never forget because. Um, I think on the record, it just says Eddie Henderson. And then they were like, and then my, my professors were like, Dr. Eddie Henderson is coming to okay. school. And I remember raising my hand and going, is Dr. Eddie Henderson the same as Eddie Henderson? Cause you know, like maybe there's two <laughs> right, of you, right, you right. know, and they were like, 
uh, I think so. And I was like, are you sure? Yeah, they didn't know. They <laughs> you, didn't know, know. <laughs> you know, and, and yeah. And, and I was, I was, you know, you, 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 I was at your clinic at school and man, I was hooked and I was, I met you at the perfect time because they didn't have a jazz trumpet teacher for the curriculum yet. So I, I was see. just taking classical lessons. So I was in need of a mentor and, and, and then, and then, you know, just by chance we meet and, and, you know, I remember some of those first lessons. I just stared at your fingers because I couldn't like, <laughs> you, you, you know, you're showing me all this stuff and I'm just like in awe, you know? <laughs> so, you know, so that, I have five that reminds of that. me, that reminds yeah. me of when Miles Davis stayed at my parents' house and I was just going to the conservatory studying classical music, you know, sure, quote sure. unquote. And so my parents had me play with one of his records by ear. You know, I had a lucky day, so I uh, I didn't miss a note. So I walked over to Miles and says, I'm still in high school, you know. I said, you know, well, how do you like that? <laughs> and he smiled at me and says, you sound good, but that's me. I said, right. whoa. <laughs> yep. So my mother wanted him to give me a lesson right at that time. So in the, in the living room, you know. And so on a piece of, uh, uh, on a napkin, I remember he drew five lines and you know how, how dark he is and his keen features. He yeah. looks so strange. Yeah. I'm just staring at him, you know. <laughs> so he drew through five lines and then a staff. And then they, down here, I mean, I, I was into the characteristic studies in the Harmon book. Of course sure, I can sure. read. Yeah. So he drew a low C and looked at me and says, this is a low C. I'm still just looking at him, you know. <laughs> then he said, E, this is an E. Then a G, this is a G. Then a B flat, all, all whole notes, you know, sure, four sure. Bs. And then at the top, he writes, this is a C7. Of course, I'm still staring at him. So he looks at me and says, don't look at me, look at the music, you <laughs> dumb <Yeah>. MF. <laughs> <laughs> And you're, and you're like 17. <laughs> yeah, I was about 17. Yeah, yeah. I never heard people talk like that. You yeah, know? yeah, I bet. I bet. Um, <laughs> let, so, so continue. Okay, so, you know, the, you're in Herbie's band for three years and he, he disbands the group. This yeah. is what I've always, this is what I've always wondered about. What was like, what was the, the day, you know, the, the first day that you, that you, the band was disbanded. What was that like? Well, you know what I mean? Like Herbie breaks up the group. What's the next day like for you? Where well, you, you know, from? he had been alluding to it that, cause we kept trying to push Herbie to incorporate that band. Cause it was ahead of his time. We were in the, at the top of the cream of the crop yeah. of yeah. quote unquote jazz and downbeat and all that stuff. Sure. And but he wouldn't make a commitment. We had meetings about it. So he finally came to us and said he was just going to go back to school and study orchestration. You know, so I was furious, yeah. you know, uh, and uh, everybody else, you know, they had been out there longer than I. They used to call me the rookie of the year. Yeah. You yeah. You you were really the. um you know, the I was the last one yeah, right, to right. ever travel, you know. Yeah. But 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 I, I, I thought it was going to last forever. Sure. So I was furious. But I understand at that time, you know, everybody in the band at that time only made, even though we worked a lot, in, in nine, ten months a year for three years, we only got $300 a week. Yeah. You know, yeah. but at that time, that was good money yeah, for yeah. a jazz band. Sure. But sure. we had to pay our hotel own hotel bill and our bills at home. Yeah. You know, yeah. Be, but still was good money for a jazz musician. Sure. But, so, but Herbie didn't get paid at all. I yeah. didn't know that. So he was in debt to his manager, David Rubinson, $30,000. And David wanted us to be more commercial. Sure. Uh, sure. You know, and so uh, from what I understand, David made a, a proclamation that he, either you give me my money or get rid of these guys. So to ease the, 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 the pain of disbanding, he told us he was 
going to uh, uh, go back to school and study orchestration and then and then film writing. So it was his best. What what could anybody say? So yeah. he disbanded. I was really hurt, you know. I bet, yeah. But I did then come to find out the headhunters opened up three weeks later, and Benny Moppin, who was with them on DC band, yeah. he had been yeah. rehearsing with, with Herbie for the new band, but didn't tell anybody. D- did you feel did you feel upset at Benny? Was there any bad blood between no, you, know, I, you know a little I, bit? Or? I was yeah, I, I said, you know, the jive, you know what, yeah, and yeah. Herbie. I mean, I was angry at Herbie for a couple of years. Wow. Then after, you know, uh, but that was just my selfish way of looking at it. You know, just like all great artists, whether it's Coltrane, Miles Davis, or her, you know, they always want to reinvent themselves. Sure. They, they don't want to just stay on their past laurels. Right, you right. Know? Yeah. <clears throat> did you, uh, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, did, you know, did it take a, uh, a while to like start, you know, would you run into Benny Moppin and you, you know, avoid him or, you know, Oh yeah, I, I'd, I'd go see him, yeah. you know, but, but after the experience I had with the NYD shit, man, my, my opinion was biased. Yeah. <laughs> but right. then, Cause just, you didn't know, right. You're saying like, you didn't know the details and stuff. So well, 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 right after the uh, Herbie more or less disbanded three weeks later, no, two weeks late. Cause I moved, I was moved back to San Francisco yeah. Art yeah. Blakey called me immediately and asked me that I want to be a messenger. I said, of course. So sure. I flew sure. back to New York and joined the messengers. You know, now, now when we finish this, I'm going to go to that story. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I was just I was just going to say, yeah, you, oh, saw, yeah. you saw me jump. <laughs> yeah. So, so so I didn't have time to bleed and cry about my pain of NYD. I was still playing, you know, with a major band. Yeah. Hey, hey, hey. hey. So I was supposed to get 475. That's what Art told me I was going to make. And so I, he said that my ticket would be at the airport from California. So, of course, when I get to the airport, no ticket. So I paid for it with my American Express, kept the receipt, got to the gig. He said, Art said 475 a week. I said, oh, this is better than Herbie, you know. Sure. Great. At the end of the first week, everybody's standing in line. John Hicks, Carter Jefferson, Mickey Bass on bass, and Art, you know, and Cedar Walton. So, Art, I put out my hand for my money. He gives me one $100 bill. I looked at it. I said, well, where's the rest of the money? He says, well, I gave the other 100 I'm supposed to get 475 right? Yeah. I gave the other hundred dollars to the dope man for the drugs you bought. I said, first of all, I don't do that. And I thought you said 475. Art tells me, are you crazy? That meant when we go overseas. I don't pay that in New York. No, I forgot about the airplane ticket. Yeah. So then he, he said, Art says, take it or leave it. Wow. For the whole week, a hundred dollars. And so then I thought to myself, well, my mother lives in New York. I said, okay, okay. And then he, he looks at me and says, what do you got, Eddie? Meaning drugs. I said, yeah. get out of here. Wow. And so the next week, I'm standing in line for the money. I was young and naive. I didn't get any advances, you know. Sure. He gives me a $50 bill with a cell phone bag of pure milk sugar saying it was drugs. So I, so I said, well, wh- why don't you give me a hundred dollars? I can buy my own sugar. <laughs> <laughs> then, it, then it got less and less and less, you know, then $25 in a bigger bag of sugar for a week playing. Yeah. We were working six nights uh, for six weeks at the village ga- gate. Yeah. I was going to say, where, where were you working? Village gate. Okay. Yeah. Well, like the jazz boat was the first gig and I still hadn't asked for my, my, my Plane ticket where I'm working in New York, yeah, having a good time, you know, hanging out, you know, acting s- stupid. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what uh, were uh, so, so, so your, you know, the the jazz messengers at that time, this is like 1973, 74, so it's it was, 73 is right yeah, when, 70- when Herbie ended the, the, the M1DC group, 
And the, so the band is Carter Jefferson, you said, John Hicks, uh, you, and uh, Mickey Me, Bass was on. Uh, bass? Uh, well, the first week it was Mickey Bass, then he changed bass, bass. bass player. Okay. Uh, then he changed piano players because he wouldn't play them. First, he had Cedar Walton, wouldn't pay him. Then they have Ronnie Matthews, wouldn't pay him. Then he had um, Walter Davis Jr., who used to play with Bird. Didn't pay him or he wouldn't show up on time. Then he gets the Albert Daly. He kept changing, you know, changing. Yeah. And, and so then we're supposed to go to Europe, play at Ronnie Scott's for three weeks. And he says, OK, I'll give you your, your 475. I said, because I quit. I quit the band. Me, right? I said, no, man, I can't go on like this. A cellophane <laughs> bag and $50. Oh, don't worry. I'll, I'll give you the regular. Your, your, your righteous money. So we go to three, to, to uh, uh, Ronnie Scott's. So I felt the man promised me. So I said, okay, uh, I'll, I'll make the tour. So for three weeks, I didn't get any advances thinking I'm a trusted gentleman, you know, the gentleman. Yeah. <laughs> At the end of the three weeks, I'm expecting to get three weeks of 475. And then knock, knock, knock on my door. I'm packing to go back to New York. I opened the door and Arch crying, literally crying. Uh, uh, uh. I said, what's wrong, Mr. Blakey? He said, he's looking down. Uh, somebody mugged me on the way to your room and took your money. <laughs> Come on. I swear was, to God. Was, oh, my, I believe you. I believe only, you. Was only, he... took, only took my money. Yeah, yeah. As I said, well, come on in the room. And you're gonna get because you're gonna get mugged again. He came <laughs> in the room and just, he had he had taken so much drug, he just nodded out face down. Oh my he god. He shot up everybody's money. And so I said, Oh, what I remember. I, I had the same receipt for the first gig of the airline ticket. He never I said, Oh, Art, here, here's the receipt for the airline ticket. He looked up at me and says, If you want to be a messenger. You get to the gig the best way you can. That's not my responsibility. Bam. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And so that's when I quit the first time, you know. And then yeah. but, but I said, well, I, I'm going back to California. And on the way out, he says, Clifford Brown never gave me this much trouble. He says, you ought to happy, be happy to play with the messages for nothing. I said, I am playing for nothing. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> I said, did you play Clifford Brown? So then every time he'd come to California on his way back from Japan, yeah. the Keystone Corner was there then. Right, right. He'd call me because he didn't play Woody Shaw or Bill Hardiman in Japan. So they'd quit. So then I remember the first time he came through California, a week at the Keystone. You want to be a man? I said, OK, of course. But I'll tell you what. He says, I said, I said how much? He said, 475. I said, no, uh, uh, the price of the eggs went up $600 at the sound check before I play a note, even there at the go. sound check. There you he, go. <laughs> <laughs> he gave me the money before, wow. even before the gig. See, wow. if he needed, if he needed you, then he was a, a, a Prince Charming. But if, if he thinks you needed him, forget about it. That's insane. It um, is. What was what was the set list like uh, when you when you were playing? Like what what tunes were you guys playing? You you had to be playing like some. Ooh, ooh, gets you along, yeah, came right. Betty, Blues March, Caravan, Up Jump Spring. Yeah, the you hits. Know, yeah, 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 the Art Blakey repertoire. Yeah, yeah, wow, that's. And he'd always feature somebody on a ballad, and uh, it was a wonderful experience. And, and through that band, you know, because I was just a novice then. Yeah. He would tell the band, uh, uh, go out of your way to make the the melody. He'd tell the horns, go out of your way to make the melody a living entity, a wow. thing. When you do that, everything after that takes place. Just don't play notes. Listen to the other horn player. And so it's like one thing. And dynamics breathe together. He verbally tell you these things, and the way Art could play an arrangement, a melody, he just teach you through his playing, his his crescendos, 
is yeah. decrescendo. It, it was like postgraduate school. I can imagine. Yeah. If, if oh, Herbie, I'm, Herbie had to have been college and then, and then art would have been yeah, grad, yeah. grad school. Right in fact, after. Herbie never told anybody how to play. Yeah, art yeah. would tell you how to do the, the basic building blocks of the true tradition of quote jazz uh, 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 at that time. Yeah. Yeah. So then, you know, the albums you start making around this time, like heritage and inside out realization and what's the other sunburst. How, how did well, well, those... well, 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 that that's in re- reverse order, reverse order. realization and inside out were done when I was, and, and was, if you notice, it was almost the same personnel yeah, on the M1 yeah. DC group, except I used two drummers instead of one. Right, right. Well, that was done when I was still in Herbie's group. Yeah. You know, and they were gracious enough to, because they, they, even though they still call me Rookie of the Year, I guess they love me and I love, it was like a family. Sure. Uh, they allowed me to do it under my name. But check this out. Rhythm section, the first one was, Herbie, Buster Williams, Billy Hart, and Lenny White. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and myself and Benny Mop. And the only one that wasn't on there was you, because I didn't want to be the exact same person as sure. NYC. She, the budget to do the whole record of those giants in music, the whole budget to record it, $1,500. Oh, my God. <laughs> Even the albums I've made are more money than that. <laughs> I'm talking about that's to pay the musicians, the recording wow. and everything. But we just did it out of love. You sure, know, of course, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I realize I have realization and in inside out on like a double CD that I got online years ago. It never leaves the house. I, I, I refuse, right. you know, it stays exactly in the same spot yeah. because yeah. And I have it on vinyl too, but it's just, they're so rare that, yeah. I, you know, yeah. I'd hate for anything to happen to them, but man, yeah. I love that stuff because it's for anyone listening to this, it, it, it sounds like a continuation and, and I'm sure you've uh, I, I'm sure I've read that you've said that uh, realization and inside out sounded like the one DC M1 well, 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 you know? realization and inside out under my name sounded m- more on the record than Herbie's record M1 DC man because Herbie's record company wanted more uh, commercial appeal yeah so yeah. they kind of watered it down but but those two wrecks, the realization the inside out was the, the way it was. Yeah. You know? Oh, incredible. I mean, it's just like the, they're just grooves. They're just, uh, yeah. Oh yeah. You know, yeah. just vans. waves of unexpected yeah, yeah. things happening. That stuff really inspired me and still does to this day where, yeah. um, a lot of my tunes are based on like, like I, I call it the blank, you know, the layering or blanket effect Absolutely. where it's like, I want, the bass to do this and this is what i want you know the harmony yeah. to do and then the horns above here and usually it's it's a lot of uh yeah freedom involved you know and, yeah and but you have a life to... support system right. or a cushion yeah. of sound so it gives you a lot of latitude and one thing i wanted to mention before during the m1 dc days you know when i first started if we're playing a tune like toys first chord is our in in, in trumpet is a c7 yeah, so I started yeah. up, I, I, I played it, you know, the chord as it was written, and then Herbie would play next. And it just sounded like Herbie was stepping outside the chord, but it would sound good. And I didn't know what he was doing, you know. So I said, well, Jesus, Herbie, it says C7, but how do you play outside of the chord? He just smiled at me, kind of like, okay, puppy, you know, patted yeah. me on my head. Yeah. He said, well, when you're playing a C7, pretend like you're playing uh, e flat seven just to go in denominations of a minor third yeah above. So or pretend yeah. like you're playing an f sharp seven or pretend like you're playing an a seven that's just one diminished scale right right and, and we and, talked about that a lot you know the, yes, uh, imposing yes. those other uh the diminished tonalities over each other and, yeah exactly yeah. and each one each diminished scale can resolve in four different places right you know, and there's only three diminished scales, each one draws in four different places. So that's the whole 12 tones. Right, exactly. <laughs> in Western music. Yeah. You know, yep. and so after a while, if, if it said C, uh, I would play a C sharp. I look over at Herbie, he kind of smiled at me. <laughs> <laughs> there you yeah. go. 
you know, dissonance, you know, because sure. usually in Western music, we're not used to, we used to the, the butter notes, as Miles Davis called them. Miles hipped Herbie to this and Herbie right. hipped me to it. You know, uh, Miles told Herbie, Herbie, don't play the butter notes. You know, when you start playing those other notes, you come to find out that scale is the tritone, uh, 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 a pentatonic. Yeah, yeah. So those other notes. So uh, with that concept, especially when you're playing the Mwadishi concept with those layers of cushions of sound, you can go any anywhere you want. And after a while, nothing sounds wrong. Everything right. is valid. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Now, moving from that, how did you get signed with Bluno and and, and and the the Heritage and Sunburst albums? How did those come about? Like, well, that happened because yeah. the, produ- the producer that that hooked me up to do uh, uh, Realization and Inside Out, uh, he was a, uh, was Norman Connors' producer, and oh, I was okay. on Norman Connors' first four albums. Yeah, and so he asked me, and, and plus he used practically. <laughs> the Mwandishi group too. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Skip drink water. So he asked me, did I have a record contract? So I said, no. So he got me realization and inside out on Capricorn records. I think that was the Almond Brothers. Yeah, record yeah, they, they, yeah, they made the album. album. Right. Almond then, Brothers. Man. <laughs> after realization and inside out, then he hooked up and got me a, a um, uh, a contract with Blue Note. Wow. And, and that's what all the Wawa pedals, uh, the phase shifters, and, and uh, the... Um, Echoplex. The right? Echoplex, yeah. yeah. And, and and so the budgets were huge on those. Remember I said realization and inside out and all that were $1,500. The budget for Sunburst and the next one, I forgot, the Heritage, Heritage $100,000. So, so we spent on each one of those Blue Note records and filing on Capitol a month in the studio, 14 hours a day, wow. seven days a week for four weeks. You know, yeah. talk about layers. And if I made a mistake, I just punch in and, and oh, make yeah. it right. Isn't that nice? <laughs> oh, 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 it was lovely. And then, and, and so, because I never played those ele- uh, electronic equipment because I, I just got it the day before the company bought it and allowed me to keep it, you know, the Wawa's yeah, and all that. Yeah. And so I was like a little boy in a candy store. Woo, 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 yeah. woo, woo. <laughs> I'm grinning like a Cheshire cat. Yeah. And then so but by punching in and punching out, it kind of formulated a style. So it sounded like I knew what, what I was doing. I, I was just... Uh, 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 by happenstance, I was lucky. Yeah, <laughs> it I see. Up with I the see. Track yeah. and everything. Sound like I knew what I was doing. I, I, I was just, you know, a lucky beginner. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I wanted to ask you what, because you you wrote a, a good amount, you know, considerably uh, for for these these four albums: uh, Realization, Inside Out, Sunburst, and Heritage. You you know. You wrote some of the uh, some of the tunes on those albums. Were yeah. You, were you writing the tunes before the session or was this because you were in like you were saying, you're in the studio all day long for you know weeks. Were you writing yeah. them in the studio? Uh, how did that well, come well, about? Let me answer that. At that time, when I did Realization <clears throat> and Inside Out, the only tune I ever wrote in my life up to that time was Dreams, the first tune oh. on, on Inside Out. Yeah, I'm not, not a composer, but I, I was just practicing one day when not with Art Blakey, and I just wrote wrote a little motif, you know, and left yeah. the space that that was reflective of my Mwandishi days, and and let the rest of the band fill in the blanks. You know that that was my concept of writing, yeah, I, because I I didn't want to write out every note because that's like a painter. If he paints in everything, that's a self-portrait. Right. <laughs> but I, I like collective portraits by leaves in space and let the musicians fill it in. And that far supersedes any self-portrait. You get so many yeah. other elements. And, and, and like you were saying, uh, on Inside Out, my name is attached to writing this and writing that. 
on a lot of those takes on there, it was just the rhythm section playing. I just laid out and let them do their thing. And then later, maybe the second or third week, like we had a, a week of basic tracks, a week of, of editing, a week of overdubbing, and a week of mixing. <laughs> 14 hours a day. Wow. I just come in and we splice what Herbie Buster and Lenny White or, and, and Billy Hart just these long rhythm tracks, and I just placed some notes on top and called it my tune. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, like, um, yeah, do, that's how, like, Dark Shadow was written. And uh, well, well, I did write see? Dark Shadows yeah. myself. Yeah. Okay. You just, yeah. You, you were just like, no, I'm going to sit down and, and write a tune. You know? Yeah, I sat down to the piano and, yeah. did, and, and had something in my head. I wrote Dark Shadows for Dreams. And I, I, I'm really not a composer, but those are the few that, that came from me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, you know, as I tell my students, if you create music in any in any way, you're a composer. So, you know. Yeah. 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 But I see and, what you're saying. You know, you're you're you, you know, uh, you you certainly play others compositions and interpret them yourself, which is right. completely artistic in and of itself. So, you know, yeah. it's it doesn't mean anything, really. It's just uh, right. Every every solo you're composing. Absolutely, absolutely. You know? Um, were you gigging with these bands? Like, like, did Sunburst come out and you were like, "All right, guys, like, you know, we're playing the Keystone and we're gonna play play the album," or were they kind of just studio? You know, did they just exist in studio? You mean when, when we did Sunburst? Or yeah, like let let's say Sunburst. Did you go? <clears throat> excuse me. Did you have a uh, you know, a band where, you know, it was you, Benny Maupin, Billy Hart, you know, uh, George Duke. Uh, were the, were you these mean bands under my name where we go work? No. Yeah. Oh, OK. Like, no, you this, know, this, some, this some just type, an isolated yeah. one month uh, project. Okay. They, uh, like uh, Al Ponch Johnson, you yep, know, who yep. used to be with Weather Report. Yeah. I never even met him yep, until yep. we got to the record date. And a lot of people on those the, those. um Electronic dates, Sunburst, uh, Mahal, Heritage, Skip Drinkwater had a lot of his friends on there uh, 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 playing percussion and stuff that I never met to this day. Mm. <laughs> oh, so they it was more like an overdub thing. Yeah. Oh, oh. I yeah. mean, 14 hours a day for one month, seven days a week. You know, I, gotcha. and I was... I never saw the sun for one month. <laughs> I was in the studio. But but you know what? During those days, remember I talked about $1,500 to do a day? Each one of those, it, it, it was a, a production contract that Skip negotiated for me. Each one of those dates, I'd go to the studio the beginning of the month. And remember I said about $1,500 through the whole record. Skip would sign me a check. $35,000 it just in my pocket was Whoa. my advance before I hit a note wow and so I and, and I do a record every nine months I said boy this is great yeah I can bet. Do this for the rest <laughs> of my life sure sign me up yeah yeah and at that particular time I was in San Francisco practicing medicine during right. the day and so I was walking around real cocky you know had to yeah right right <laughs> i thought it was the king of the world man. now did you stay in touch with miles davis around this time and if so what what did he think of your of these albums I, I would see him every now and then when he'd come this that when I, I was living in san francisco sure yeah during those yeah. days and i would go see him whenever he'd come to town at the keystone corner and we, we just joke with each other you know but i, I would be listening to you to him astutely to see what he was doing you know he was yeah, playing yeah. with the wawa and, and um uh that's all i can say about that you yeah know? okay okay he was he was, he, he was my first hero where the light really came on then yeah, i got of course. other heroes after that you know freddie lee morgan uh a book a little woody shaw and all that um so <laughs> You know, at, you know, in all during this, you're friends with Freddie Hubbard and Lee Morgan. Yeah. You know what? How did you hook up with them? Like, you know, how, well, did, how did you meet those guys? Well, you know, like I said, my first 
role model was Miles when I was in high school and early college. Yeah. And then I used to hear uh, um, during that time in college, I used to hear Freddie and before I met them, yeah. used to hear them come to San Francisco with Art Blakey. And I was just amazed how they played, you know. Right. And when I moved back to New York, um, you know, that 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 record Night, Night of the Cookers yep. with Freddie Hubbard and Lee Morgan. Yeah. Uh, uh, on that record, there's a lot of it was a live uh, recording. Yep. All that screaming on the record was me. I was in the front row. I've wow. heard that. I, I, I've heard that. I've recently yeah. become aware of that. And uh, yeah. I need to go back and listen and listen for you. Yeah. And and so I went back and 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 used to follow Freddie and Lee like puppy. Because I went backstage, met Freddie, used to go over his house and and follow him to his gigs. He let me sit in. Yeah. This when I was in medical school. Right. Right. And right. then he introduced me to actually I met Lee even when I was in college uh, when he was with Art Blakey. You know, uh, I went backstage and he was always so nice to me. You know and. And so I used to go over Lee's house. I drive up to New York almost every other weekend. On Saturday morning, I go to Freddie's house, watch him practice, see him learn his licks, you know, go club hopping with him. Yeah, he let yeah. me sit in. I go to Lee's house on Sunday. We play 60 duets together yeah, out of yeah. out of um, the yeah, Arvin book. Right. Yeah. yeah. I'd fo I follow both of them around like a little puppy dog. And then one, one funny story, uh, um, once I was driving Lee to a, this after hour gig in Harlem from like four in the morning to seven in the morning. And it was supposed to be, Lee told me to come in with him. The sign said, Lee Morgan and Kenny Dorham tonight at the after hour club. So Kenny Dorham didn't show up. So Lee told me to tell, he said, tell the dude that you're Kenny Dorham. You can play my flugelhorn. Ah. So I walked in and sat in with Lee. And, and so on the way out, you know, um, <clears throat> Lee puts his hand out in those days to get the money from the club owner. Club owner gives him $40. So Lee hunched me against him, telling me of Kenny. I said, hi, I'm, I'm Kenny Dorham. So the dude gives me $40. So we get outside, Lee smiles and said, that's how you do that, Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, he was cute. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we, yeah. We had a, a real nice relationship. That's that's you know, it it really does warm my heart that to hear stuff like that. You know, you, you yeah, know, you know, there's a saying that, you know, you shouldn't meet your heroes because you don't want to ever be disappointed, you know, if they you know, yeah, they're yeah, bad yeah. Dude and they're a jerk to you or something. Yeah. But to 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 you know, hear stories like that, 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 that's, yeah, that's so cool. And that, you know, in just as important yeah. as the music yeah, is, are these relationships, like, yeah. you know, what, what was it like hanging out with him? Did you guys get pizza together? Like, you know, was it like that or, you know, were, well, 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 with Lee, he was always nice to me. Yeah. I've seen him be very abrasive to other people and sure. I've heard stories about him, uh, uh, but he uh, directed at me. He never did it. Yeah. So uh, he, he, it's always won my heart to talk about him. Now, Freddie, you know, uh, his, he, I don't know if you ever met him. His, his personality, so he'd be like Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, yeah, you know, yeah. but he played so good when he was uh, uh, Mr. Hyde. I just let it go because he played so good. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's um, I, I, I was telling you that I found uh, there's a couple of tracks on the Internet of um Joe Henderson at the Keystone Corner, 19, uh, New Year's Eve, 1978 into 1979. And the band has you. Oh, uh, and, Julian preached it. Yeah. Um, shit, I'm forgetting the rhythm section. I, I should look it up while we're Al talking. About it. Albert Daly on piano. Okay. So you remember who else? Well, 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 it's ironic you bring that up. I was talking to Javon Jackson uh -huh. and he was telling me he was listening to that. It was me, Freddie, Joe Henderson, yep. and Julian yep. Priester, the front line, playing Invitation. Yeah, Invitation. Um, one of Joe's minor blueses, and the and the the name right. is escaping me. And I uh, recorded me. Record, I, and recorded I me. Yes, it yeah. recorded me. I, I, I can see it like right in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like is that on yeah, the record? Uh. 
somebody must have recorded it. It's on YouTube. I'll I'll send I'll send Natsuko the, the oh, link wow. so you can listen to it. But I think so. First off, I you know obviously I think it's fan. You know I love your playing on it. I I think it's fantastic. But I love listening to you play your solo and then Freddie Hubbard plays after you. First off, I don't know how you did it without shaking like a leaf. I well, I was shaking. <laughs> <laughs> I I well then you know what I give you credit for being able to play this play a solo knowing he was following you. Oh yeah yeah, it, yeah it had to have felt like Jaws circle you know yeah, yeah. the shark fin you know I, I, I remember that because on on invitation you know that's Joe's favorite turn to Joe Kelly burned it up right yeah and then Freddie while Joe's playing he looks at me and says do you know the bridge uh, what's the first chord in the bridge so I told him you know uh, uh, our e flat minor he he rolled his eyes like he he didn't want me to know what it was you know <laughs> and, uh, and so, so, yeah so when joe finished <laughs> freddie looked i looked at freddie you know you want to like oh no eddie after you oh. <laughs> he, he wanted to be the cleanup man <laughs> yeah yeah it, it's funny like man you know you certainly hold your ground. Like you sound confident and, and you're playing, you know, you're playing great. And it's like, it's like kind of, you get extra points because I know Freddie Hubbard is coming. Oh and, yeah. 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 You know what yeah, I mean? It's, yeah, it's like, yeah. a, it's like watching an old world war two movie and you're, you're, you know, you're one plane and he's the German fighter coming in from, Oh house, yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. Yeah. He's yeah. Coming in. <laughs> You know, yeah. and the fact that you make it out at the end is, uh, you know, alive right. is I survived is, exactly is, so, is something <laughs> to, to talk be said. about it. But I, I, I remember the thing that helped me, as I was saying, because I knew him on a personal level before that. I'd seen him go through antics with so many other people. I thought to myself, okay, I'm going to play first. He's going to wipe me out, but he's just a man like any other man. That 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 was my thought process. Sure. Sure. To get me through it. If if he bleed as uh, as Arnold Schwarzenegger would say, if it bleeds, we can kill it. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so I I read recently that um you felt like you went through at least one period where you felt like you had to reinvent yourself. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. What, yeah. what do you yeah. what do you mean by that? What what did? Um, well, that's when I moved back to New York. Sure. Because during the M1 Dishi time. You know, I joined and I, you know, the music was so open ended. I could play anything I wanted. I really hadn't formulated or gotten my bebop stuff together and play in terms of playing changes. Yeah. But in that context of that band, I didn't have to play change. I could play anything I wanted, you know, so I could play out in whatever, you yeah. know. And then when I joined Art Blakey, I had to go back and play, you know, the traditional messenger stuff. And through that, I kind of realized I really don't have my foundation together. And then when I moved back to San Francisco, I was trying to do my bands and stuff, you know, quote unquote, my bands, you know, uh, for 10 years. Then when I decided to move to New York, you know, coming to the East Coast, guys played at a little higher level. That's when I realized I better go back and, and get my stuff together. Now, that's what the steeplechase albums where, where I tried to not, not change my style but more or less I, I tried to work on on my weaknesses rather sure, than sure. my strength go out and play things where I just sounded good yeah, I tried yeah. to work step by step you know and then that's a lifelong process yeah yeah you know? but I remember one thing that Miles Davis told me uh, uh one time he came to me when I was working with Art Blakey he said, he said, Eddie came backstage. He said, Eddie, you sound good, but stop trying to play the trumpet and play music. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> That's heavy. <laughs> what, what a mouthful. Yeah. You know, because a lot of people, because the, the trumpet is just an extension uh, uh, hanging out your mouth through which to play music. Right. A lot of people get that confused. They think the trumpet is the end point. No, that's the vehicle. Right. Uh, uh, through which you played music. And so I, I, I was trying to have that in mind. Also trying to play the trumpet. Also trying to understand how man to maneuver through changes. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. You know, and 
And, and did you feel like you had to do that, uh, uh, that reinvention again one more time? Did I, did I read that or like in the nineties or, or it was just that steeplechase era? In the nineties, the steeplechase stuff. And then when I, then I joined Kenny Barron's band yeah. for six years, yeah. his quintet with me and John Stubblefield and all the Kenny Stones were originals. So I tried to incorporate what I learned harmonically and gotcha. playing music. And then since Kenny played with Dizzy Gillespie for 10 years, and he was such a supportive piano player, it really helped me, you know, fill in the gaps yeah. and learn, learn how to leave space. You know, Miles told me also one time, you don't have to play everything all the time. <laughs> right, right. You know? Yeah. Well, you know, when I, when I, I, I'll never forget when I met you, 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 you handed your syllabus, you know, and, and, and it's this packet that you, you give your students and it has all the information that, you know, you've collected from miles and, and from yeah. Hubbard and Lee Moore. And I remember like, it, it felt like I was holding the Bible, you know, it was just yeah, like, yeah, you yeah. know, there's like, there's like this Lee Morgan page and I'm like, what am I supposed yeah. to do with this? Yeah, Freddie, and then you would it, but then you explain. I, I think it. I gave you volume one. Since then, I wrote in the vo volume two, an extension of it. But if I tried, I went out of my way to try to write in all the basic building blocks that because I, I always equated uh, scales with words. Yeah. They don't go anywhere. They don't make a resolution. Then you come to two, five, one, three, six, two, five, one. And then patterns I used to hear Freddie do things I got from Clifford Brown, you know, I tried to do it step by step to make, you know, musical logical sense. Yeah. No, I mean, it does, <laughs> you know, oh, good, I, uh, 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 I, I just think that you are truly a individual on the instrument. You there, like oh, there thanks. is really no one who, uh, who sounds like you. And I've always, I've always felt you, I've always felt unique as your student because you sound so original. And, and I've talked, I've talked to you, uh, about you too, Josh Bruno, who we both know and love, uh, Jeremy, yeah. I, I, you know, uh, in that, you know, it's like I, any chance I can tell your story. I do because I feel like there's just, there's so many trumpet players who may have heard of you, but like have not really dug into your, 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 music. I understand you know, in your style. And it's just, I, I think it's, I think it's wonderful. <laughs> that, that, that's funny. You say that you, you pick my brain a lot. Some people come up to me and said, Oh, Eddie, I like your style. Then I say my style, my style is just a collage of bits and pieces that I've stolen from other people and just scotch taped together. Right. <laughs> you know, and then that's how, People talk about the Miles Davis style as if Miles Davis just dropped out of a sky in a vacuum. Miles Davis copied Freddie Webster, note for note, sound right. conception, right. except Freddie Webster was, it wasn't that heard of. He only yeah. recorded yeah. eight bars on a Dinah Washington album. Right. But, right. but Dex, Dex, I mean, uh, John Coltrane sounded exactly like Dexter Gordon, who was his hero. Yeah. who he yeah. tried to emulate when he first joined Miles. Yeah. But after you get your feet on the ground and get a little vocabulary together, then when I, uh, years ago, I used to think, oh, I can play like Freddie, I can play like Lee, I can, uh, can play like this person or that person. Then I started to try to emulate saxophone players or phrase like piano players. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, I said, now, wait a minute, who am I? Right. <laughs> Well, you're this. You're this I'm imitating everybody else, but who am I? <laughs> yeah, but you've 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 been so success. You're so successful at me at, at taking all of these players that you're talking about, and you've blended them together. I think that that's part of it. You know, you you know the assimilation. Of, yeah. of of all these players it's it's all there like i could hear the lee morgan in your plan and i hear the miles in your plan yeah. but i know it's you and i think that's what yeah well, well that, that's, so the, that's the, the name of the game in this ethnic tradition uh uh you know play one note or two notes and and everybody around the world say oh that's so and so that's so and so you know yeah. for real and uh we we uh 
this fall we talked about briefly uh Tara Masahinu who oh yeah who I've recently uh really gotten into and I hear you know I I I hear some similarities between you guys. They're- oh yeah, well he and I are good friends. He's a lovely player. Yeah. So I remember one time way back when I first heard of Terramasa, he was playing us. This is before I met him. Yeah. And I heard a record, and he did like a chromatic, and I said, "Damn, I don't remember recording on that record. I thought it was me." Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yes, that's something. You ever tell him that? You ever did you ever yeah, say that? To yeah, him? yeah. Oh, he must have laughed at that. Yeah, huh? I guess we listened to the same records, you know. Yeah, well, I, you know, I think if you know, I think if there was anyone who sounded similar to 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 you, it would it would be him, and and that's been like a recent, uh, wow, that's it, man. Any, a, a recent discovery of mine because I just I think what happened was his albums, uh, all his Japanese albums got. They, they got put on, the, you know, iTunes and Apple Music and, and right, I think right. they're more accessible now. So because for a while right. he was just like on a Elvin Jones record I knew of, you know, oh, wow. Now, wow. now a lot of his own stuff is is available. So I've just been oh, like, he's a great player. Is a Wonderful incredible, person. Incredible. Yeah, very that's, warm, very accessible. You know, that's that's great. That's great. Yeah. And um, I just I just want to, you know, we're, we're wrapping it up here. OK. And, and you know. Uh, you know, Josh Bruno is a student of yours and he's a good friend of mine. We, we sing your praises all the time. I told oh, him, I, he says love you, too. <laughs> um, love both of you. Uh, we, we love you, man. And, and, uh, the, the, what we do, you know, you talk about your, you know, your interactions with, uh, Lee and, and Freddie and, and, and Woody Shaw and stuff. When Josh and I are at a jam session, we play your licks that you taught us. As uh-huh. like a way, as a way to like, you know, tease each other, or like if, oh, I'm, yeah. if I'm on the stage and he walks in, I'll I'll play something that you know you taught us so that he knows right. you saw him, you know, and and yeah, that, you know, and that, that that's what Jeremy when I walk in a club or Jeremy walks in a club, we do the we do, <laughs> like having to come back and yeah. forth, and we know what we mean, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's beautiful, man. It's just a beautiful. Oh movie. yes, sir. Um, Eddie, you are you are. I am so grateful to have you in my life, man. And thank oh, you for being on the show. Mutual. Oh, thank you. Mutual, thank you for man. being on the show. Thank and, you. Uh, and, uh, you know, <laughs> I hope to see, you know, we're, we're going to, we're going to both be vaccinated. I'm going to come and give you a big hug because. It's, yeah. It's yeah. Well, we could do this forever. You know, because, you know, I'm accessible, you know, the yeah. number anytime. My pleasure. Thank you, thank you so much. All right. Thank on you, that too. note, thanks for being on the show and we'll. Catch okay, you buddy. Soon. All right, man. Thank Take you. Care. Thank you. Hope I see you soon. Definitely. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. (laughs) Wow. Um, That was just, that was just so, so much fun. And, uh, I'm just glad that so many of you guys listening uh, got to hear such awesome stories. I'm such I was smiling ear to ear. I was a kid in a candy store. I, uh, you know, I just I I'm sure you heard how much I was just soaking that up and smiling and cheesing all over it. And, you know, and I hope you guys were too. Um, just Eddie is just a kind soul and, and he's lived like this full life, you know what I mean? And, and, and so much jazz, so, so many jazz moments, you know, um, I don't even know how to explain it really, you know, just all these great moments. I shouldn't call them jazz moments. They're just moments in his life that are incredible. Um, you know, it's funny. I, I wanted to bring this up in the interview and I totally forgot because I was cheesing. Um, I, I knew the moment I felt like Eddie accepted me under his wing and, uh, and my man, Josh Bruno, will he'll understand this, but, uh, after a lesson, I w- you know, my lesson was supposed to be like an hour and it goes over probably like to an hour and a half. And, you know, Eddie and I just start talking. This might have been like maybe my third or fourth lesson with him. So, you know, I would only go see him every like three to six months, depending. It was, it, you know, it was I'd see him and then he'd send me home with stuff to work on. So he didn't want 
me coming back per se the next week because he wanted to see you know that I you know he wanted to give me time to work on the material and come back and and show progress and stuff so maybe this was like a year and a half into knowing him or or maybe at least a year because I was only newly 21 at the time and uh, at the end of the gig <laughs> you know he could t- I could tell he was just kind of like in a hanging mood you know he wasn't like you know, rushing me out and I wasn't like in a rush to leave the apartment. And, uh, he, he leans in and he goes, are you 21? And I said, yeah. And he goes, and he handed me money. He handed me like a 10 or a 20 or something. He goes, go downstairs, (laughs) buy me a six pack. And I was like, okay. And, um, I went downstairs. It was like a little bodega or, you know, packy downstairs. And I bought like a six pack of Coors Light because I had no idea what the man drank, you know, and I'm like fucking 21. So what do I know about what I, about beer? And, uh, I bring it back and we actually shared a couple of beers on the, f- uh, looking out the window and he, and, and at this apartment in Mamaroneck, he used to live on main street and we were just watching the people and we were just talking about shit. And, That's like the moment I realized that like I made, you know, one of the many moments I knew I made the right choice to kind of follow him around. But definitely, I think the moment in which he realized like, you know, he took me under his wing and it's just forever grateful for that kind of shit. You know what I mean? It's it's just a beautiful thing. Uh, Seriously, check out Eddie's music. If you need recommendations, uh, I will be happy to recommend albums to you. Um there's really not not a bad album out there. Uh, his newest one, Shuffle and Deal on Smoke Records, Smoke Session Records, is phenomenal. If you want to hear the man, you know, doing what he does best, that w- that is a a great album to get. Um, his stuff on Steeplechase will always be my favorites. Um, you know, jazz quintet. Uh, with uh, trumpet vibes, piano, bass, and drums, you know, playing some, you know, blue note standards, as I've said before on the show, and, you know, a couple original tunes and, and some standard standards. Uh, killing, killing stuff. His 90s stuff, I love so much. If you can get a hand, uh, a copy of Re- Reemergence, it's from like 1995 or 4 or something like that. He plays like all these Gershwin tunes. If you if you want to hear it, if you got to hear it, I know that one's really hard to find. I, I'll, I'll be happy to... Uh, to you know let you listen to it send you some tracks um and yeah you know i mean definitely check out uh, uh the m1 dc stuff uh of course and um you know check out jeremy pelt's book because there's a chapter on eddie in there you get more of what we're talking about um and uh if if you really want to dive into the m1 dc stuff like i did uh get bob gluck's book you'll know when you get there which is a real real uh, exquisite, um, first, you know, for real firsthand account kind of stuff of the band. I used it as one of my primary sources for my uh, master's thesis, which was, uh, on the band. So, uh, I can, I can fanboy about Eddie all day long. So feel free to hit me up. I'll talk to you about any (laughs) one of his records. Um, yeah, I mean, what, what is there more to say? There isn't right. So I think I'll leave you guys here. Uh, I I really hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. It, it just I, I can't say it enough. It just made it made my year. It really did, and I'm forever grateful. And uh, as I list on every album I I do, uh, thank you, Dr. Eddie Henderson, for not only teaching me to be uh, a, a a good musician, but a better human being. So, with that. This has been Mr. Millennial's Revenge. I'm your host, Nick DiMaria. This is a production of the New Haven Jazz Underground, and I'll see you at the next episode. Thanks so much. Take care. (laughs) 